John Clark Ridpath was an American historian of the late 19th century whose work had great influence. His literary books would become detailed, dense, and filled with stunning illustrations. In 1894, Ridpath published the first edition of his History of the World. The book was said to have provided readers with a complete history of known human civilizations at that point in the timeline, beginning with ancient Egypt and ending with the First World War. He dealt with political, economic, social, and cultural issues in an attempt to bring within the average reader a concise and accurate summary of the principal events in the career of the human race. The series was immensely popular and was reissued with additions numerous times in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He would later go on to write and publish a popular history of the United States of America. Although Ridpath's works are amazing due to their striving to integrate what was then cutting-edge scientific research into history, they do have some minor downfalls. For personal historic views, which bear the stamp of their time, made their way into the text. Like many European and American intellectuals of the late 19th century who carried beliefs of Eurocentrism, Ridpath was influenced by social Darwinism, nationalism, patriarchy, and imperialism which would later be disguised as globalism. Many are familiar with Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. However, it's not as known that the full text is actually on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Specifically, Ridpath and other historians of the time period are said today to have used social Darwinist concepts of race and geography to explain the so-called national character of a wide variety of civilizations, and did so operating with explicit notions of racial hierarchy, calling Native Americans sometimes barbarous when they were the truly spiritually advanced ones who lived in harmony with nature, or associating Africa as the dark continent, and blatantly referring to Africans as black savages. By acknowledging the historical context of this type of skewed intellectual environment, one can examine the ways in which imperialism shaped many European and Americans' understandings of history, progress, and the world around them, which ultimately fueled division and lacked inclusion, passion, and equilibrium. Aspects of this 17th century view of occurrences from the past still exist today, holding a legacy of imperial thinking, only being more covert today than it was overt in the past. For as Leo Tolstoy once said, History would be a wonderful thing if it were only true. For the victors rewrite history. Thus history is the fictional stories of the winners of the battlefield through all time to murder the memory of the defeated. What's popular is almost always not accurate or true. And notice how the 1876 version of Ridpath's American history was titled a popular history of the United States of America. Amongst a long list of logical fallacies, that one is called the fallacy of the majority. It's not the majority trend to say that one can both see the benefits of their heritage, the many things in which it does well, while also at the same time seeing the negatives, which it has done poorly. I, being an American, for example, can see that America's founding documents are excellent, built on liberty and independence, while at the same time recognizing that strive was built on the back of enslaving Africans and horrible mistreatment of indigenous North Americans. Behaviors which, at one point, were socially acceptable, are later realized to be inaccurate. Lynchings in the United States, for example, used to be quite common, where a family would get together and watch a human being who had a darker shade of skin be hung and then burned to a crisp. That is today, for the most part, acknowledged as having been a group mental sickness via the perpetrators. Or African Americans, who absolutely still have extra layers of hardship and concern when dealing with elements of society, especially law enforcement. As there is no society on the planet handing out rights, it's become learned that you have to fight for them. For as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Of course black lives matter, yet all skin tones matter, all lives matter. All men, which at the time of its writing meant both women and men, are created equal. No way in equality of outcome, but absolutely in equality of opportunity. A child that grows up in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro has no less value than that of a British royal baby, who's kept in the hospital for three days after their birth so their exact astrological birth time can't be publicly known. Being of European descent, 
we can see the imperial legacy of rid past historical view in the forms of crusading, colonialism, and off-balance thinking of superiority, often inaccurately and hierarchically placing white Europeans as superior to other races. We can sympathize with those subject to hardships of our ancestors, but be conscious to not repeat those past errors in our own lives while at the same time not being self-hating white people who don't also appreciate the beautiful art, literature, and architecture of European culture and paint every Caucasian with such a broad brushstroke as to say we are all guilty of X, Y, or Z and need to kneel down in inferiority because of what our ancestors did before we were even born. We can also see clearly that mass migration that uproots a people due to extreme economic hardship from a poorer country to a more affluent country is today used as a tool to divide and conquer, as well as a technique to uproot a population of people in what has become their native soil and causes more harm to that country's population than it does good. Just like the Europeans did to the indigenous population of America when they first settled on the land. African, Asian, Latin American, and European continental human groups have all been oppressed through time whether it be for the iron yoke slavery of the past or the wood yoke slavery that still exists today, with all having been human trafficked for forced labor and sacrifice all over the world, including their own people, all for cutthroat economic purposes. Isolating one particular group as the problem and another as the most oppressed is meant to divide one against the other. Even though in certain periods of the timeline, one group has been more on the receiving end than the other, throughout all time, every race has gone through their oppressions. Oftentimes, a catalyst for public outcry will accurately identify a problem, but then inaccurately identify a solution. Whether it be burning books or taking down statues, revising history has always gone on. For as George Orwell wrote, every record has been destroyed or falsified, every book rewritten, every picture has been repainted, Every statue and street building have been renamed. Every date has been altered. And the process is continuing day by day, minute by minute. For an enemy is not in a book which one thinks they need to burn, or in a statue which one thinks they need to take down, the act of which makes one a history rewriter. But instead, it's those who control the divide and conquer narrative that make one think they need to erase our history and rewrite it in the first place as even the darkest parts of a country's history must be remembered so that they are not repeated. All one need do is look towards the capstone of the economic pyramid, which seeks to divide and control. The world's problems are due to grossly misstratified economics by a small amount of parasitic centralized systems at the top of the power pyramid. Since power corrupts, aristocratic bloodlines and godzillionaires who run the imperial machines of commerce hold the puppet strings, yet are a sliver of a sliver of a sliver of the world's population. And the long con has been to divide and conquer by these few over the many, economically impoverishing parts of the world for their resources and rewriting history or tricking us to do it ourselves. Their illusions sell fear, obedience to authority, separation, division, and abdication of individual sovereignty through time the tentacles of which operate in different, more overt and covert ways throughout the planet based upon how fundamental the country's political power pyramid capstone has become. For if one controls language, then they control thought, and the negative patterns continue playing out time and time again. For this has seemed to go on through much of our backstory, almost as some sort of teaching tool, causing the populace to have to learn through hardship. Why, for example, are humans as a whole called the human race? the etymology of which was installed long ago to imply competition and division against one another. As we are never given wisdom from socioeconomic top-down sources, those that do embody wisdom have learned to do so by example through connection, wholeness, abundance, unity, and empowerment of the individual through time via the awakening human and that our obstacle to overcome is not our brothers and sisters, who we hold hands with, standing together in solidarity, whichever part of the world their people originate from. Coming to know it's not about us versus them, but instead economic justice, decentralization, local community improvement in our own native lands, and not consenting to outside authority, as everyone throughout the world has the right to liberty and well-being to seek out the mystery of life. 
all of which stems from a much deeper story regarding our origins and existence. As few seem to question or often wonder why we truly originated and why we came into being, forgetting who we are and the mystery of where we have come from. Various belief systems tell us that they have figured out all those answers, yet have become top-down structures themselves, wanting to sell easy answers to get us to outsource our power, and as a result, are in no way wanting to give truths as to why human beings exist. Being similar, but at the same time so different from the other living creatures we share our home with. Whichever way we are pulled, which usually stems from our upbringing, the other side of the coin is always there which creates false opposition to get ideologies in fighting. For so often, it appears as if we are being bombarded by a continual barrage of ideas, images, and events that seem to reinforce an apparent divisiveness and separation that exists between these illusory different ideologies. Humanity itself seems as if it is falling apart at the seams as the old dysfunctional paradigm disintegrates, unraveling more and more before our very eyes. Incredulous incidents seem to boil over our inherent differences, generating what appears to be a fractious, divided world. Some have referred to this phenomenon as the illusion of separateness. While it is indeed true that we are materially separate, corporeal, distinct, and unique individual beings, paradoxically, we are all one unified, holonomic, energetic field of mysterious existence, both whole and part of the whole. A fractal holographic web, intimately and intricately interconnected and interwoven into the very fabric of our being. Yet, there are those that still seem to remain wholly unconscious or unaware of the existence of this underlying unity, buying the imperial playbook and effectively asleep within the dualistic nature of physical reality as a result. Even those who have experienced the truth of this underlying unitive nature of existence, regardless of where on the planet our ancestors come from, either through a deep spiritual awakening or philosophical or intellectual understanding of the underlying physics of this reality, often wrestle with the conundrum of how to reconcile this polar opposites within our nature. Such is the major reason for the mystery of our existence. For the etymology of the word history is his story, and the etymology of the word mystery is my story. So my story is to seek out the mystery of life, and in doing so, we are shown the middle path to both light and dark, and all shades in between having potential value mapping the polarity of the material realm and finding equilibrium because that's where the power lies. When enough people do this, in the aggregate, we cease to be so polarized against one another, racially, culturally, or politically, and stop giving our power away to outside sources, which leads to individual empowerment and a brighter future for the world's peoples as well as other sentient life within the environment. For everyone on the planet wants to have liberty, we just have different ideas as to how to get there because we've been unconscious to how much we've been manipulated by a tiny cult for so long. Yet globally, we are now at the twilight of empire and larger percentages of us are now ceasing to give consent to this old hierarchical operating system. Ridpath and others who have written the history books were giving us at a price his story and not your story of how we interact with the mystery of the world. So this has been a brief glimpse of my story of his story.